dissertation is about 18th century views on the epistemology of infinitary mathematics. You don't have to understand what that meant. It was, I'm just trying to blind you with science a little bit. Um, so I picked these paintings by Gerhard Richter, the series of four called Ice, um, because I think they're an especially perspicuous exhibition of the manner in which he paints, and they thematize their mode of production in an interesting way. So uh, he, he charges up these squeegees that are really broad, that are like the size of a canvas, and then he drags wet paint over the surface of the canvas. And after doing this many, many times, the squeegees both lay down paint and pick it up. They have little skips in them, and you get this really interestingly complex, and I'm going to argue infinitely complex, structure in the image. So a few months after he painted these, he, he wrote in his notebook, Quote, except that I can plan nothing. Every plan that I entertain regarding the structure of the picture is false. And if its execution is nevertheless successful, that's only because I partly destroyed the plan or because it works despite itself. To accept this, that I can plan nothing, is often unbearable and even impossible, since as a thinking, planning human being, it's humbling to experience that I am so utterly powerless. My only consolation is that it is still I who has made these pictures, even if they do function according to their own lawfulness, and use me as they will to just somehow come into being. When viewed this way, the whole seems very natural, or better, naturely, natuaha, alive. So there are two aspects of this quotation that I find really fruitful, not only for understanding the paintings, but also for springboarding into my own work. One is the idea that it's not just difficult, but in principle impossible for him to plan the eventuating structure of these images. It's impossible, I think, because plans involve classification. They involve like bringing things under a category. Apply red here, say. And Classifications are always partial and abstract. We can make them more specific, not just red, but maroon. And we can make them as specific as we like, but they'll never be infinitely specific. And the structure I think we see here is infinitely specific in the mathematical sense. It's both quantitatively infinitely specific, it's extended in space, and so we can cut it up in limitless ways into parts. And it's qualitatively infinite, in that we get these beautiful, mesmerizing drifts of hue as the colors blend into one another. This continuity exhibits the, the, the real complexity of the variety of color that you can get. And part of the way of painting this way brings out that the structure that's precipitated necessarily outruns any plan he could have had for making it. And the hero of my dissertation, Immanuel Kant, was the first philosopher, I think, to really appreciate the philosophical depth of this um, complement and mismatch between classification, which is always finite, if arbitrarily specific, and infinite complexity, which is what we're presented with in the world. So Kant thought that this showed that we have to have two distinct cognitive faculties in order to know anything, really. One is a faculty of classifying. We have to find order. We have to find structure. We have to bring things under concepts in order to render them intelligible. But on the other hand, what we thus render intelligible is infinitely complex. And so we have to exercise a faculty of classification, judgment, even as we're put in touch with a thing that in principle outstrips all of our powers of classification. The second part of the quote before I close that I think is really interesting, expresses, as it were, the flip side of this thought, that the paintings have their own lawfulness. They are not just like nature, they are as of nature. They, they realize their own nature. What I think is going on here is registering that there is a structure here. It's not one that's imposed by the mind, but it's one that the mind is receptive to, one that the mind can accommodate. And so even though we can't know everything, there is nothing that in principle we cannot know. 
We can know anything, but not everything. There's nothing that, in principle, escapes our powers of classification. So this shows not only that these two powers of the mind must be distinct, but it also shows that we don't need a further power in order to know things. That's enough to be put in touch with infinite complexity and to be able to bring it under classifications of categories. And I think that Gerhard Richter's thematization of his mode of production here gets us at this fundamental epistemological dialectic that's at the core of my, my own work. So thanks for your attention. Um, also, spend some time with these because they're, they're really fantastic and um, deserve their own moment. I have infinitely many, um, but one of them, the first one is, doesn't the limitation of the human sensory apparatus impose a granularity on the possible experiences I can have, mm. such that it's merely a metaphor to say it's infinitely complex because there's just a limit, say, the number of colors I can see or the number of textures I can see, beyond which there's just the unknowable. So I, I have a two-part answer to that question. One, one has to do with the paintings and aesthetic experience. And um, there, there are a couple of lines of thought on the matter. One is that, you know, so it's an interesting fact that um, art forgery is possible, but only for a limited period of time. Um, art forgers are incredibly good at tricking their own generation that, that this is a Vermeer rather than, you know, an imitation. If you look back 40 years hence on those paintings that were passed off as Vermeers, even a layperson can see that can't be Vermeer. So, in a sense, um, the aesthetically significant and perceptible <coughs> properties of the painting aren't really fixed. They can evolve with our own degree of sophistication. The, the answer that doesn't have to do with paintings, but has to do with <coughs> just epistemology, our knowledge of the world generally, is this. I think Kant is operating with a notion of sensibility that doesn't register these phenomenological limitations. I think he argues in something like this way. Look, if it's possible for us to know the world, and it's true that Newtonian science, which applies the calculus in explaining phenomena, describes the world, then we have to have access to this infinite complexity. Otherwise, our knowledge is just without basis. The fact that we can't become explicitly conscious of the infinitesimally small or drink in the infinitely large is actually not relevant to the epistemological question of whether we can know, whether we have grounds for claiming that things are infinitely complex. And he thinks we do have such grounds and that mathematics proves it. Yeah. I was really struck by the quote from the artist yeah. uh, where he says something like, it's it's impossible for me to plan this because uh, in, in arriving at the outcome, some part of the plan is destroyed. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what your thoughts are about how that applies to human activity in general. So I'm a dancer and I'm thinking about the fact that when you're dancing, you have a plan about what you're gonna do, but what happens is a bit out of your control and how, like you can't control everything. And also how it's perceived is out of your control. So then that made me think that maybe everything is like, the way the artist described this. Yeah. Um, well, I do want a certain pretty ambitious generalization to come out of what's being thematized in this painting. So I'm pretty comfortable with that. Um, as for the... So there's no such thing as plans. Not <laughs> true. Um, not that far. I'm willing to go thus far, but no further. So I think there's a fundamental and principled gap between what can be planned and its realization. That doesn't mean it's not a realization of the plan. It just means the plan can't, can't bring us all the way to its execution. There's, there's room for judgment, and there's room for the world to start to making decisions for us. Then there's this phenomenon of the world kind of being a cooperative agent in your action. That's part of what Richter is really interested in, and that's a really hard thought to get your mind around, because in a way, it is 
part of his understanding of what he's doing that he's got a plan and it's also going to be co-determined by the world. Um, and then it's, I mean, there's a bad way this can happen. The world can just be stubborn and not <laughs> agreeable and our plans can come to grief as we all know too well. But there's also a weird kind of union with the world that we can come into in coming up with something that involves our agency but also requires a complement that has an order and lawfulness of its own that we have to be friendly to and that has to be friendly to us. Um, and I think that's, that's going on here too. Uh, it's funny uh, what you thought about the fact that his meaning is sort of two-dimensional. Um, because, like you just said, uh, it has its own laws. Paint has its own laws. It builds up on the skin, as you said. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and, and it causes things. Rather than, I was thinking, well, well I mean, you, know, you could have used markers or, or pastels or something. Yeah. But the fact that it's three, it is layers and layers and layers. Is there anything you think that has a lot to do with what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, so the fact that oil paint can layer in this way, and that it's tackiness means that it pulls some paint off sometimes, even as it's laying paint down. And the squeegee like digs in and reveals earlier layers. Um, I think that that both communicates a kind of temporality of the paint. We think of it as having a history. It's almost got this geological structure. Um, so it is two-dimensional quite image, but the structure of the image actually communicates that there's a great deal that we're not seeing, a great deal that's hidden from um, these can feel veiled, or they feel to me sometimes like standing in a forest and you have this necessary occlusion of the distance by just a, a growing accumulation of trees. And you can walk through it, as it were, you can push through the layers, but you can never bring them all into focus at once. And it, it's part of that kind of limitation. You can go anywhere in the forest, but you can't see the forest for the trees. That, I think, is another way of getting at this interplay between what you classify, which is infinite and outstrips your classification, and your classifications of it, which are capable of dealing with every part of it, but not all at once.